Origami, from the Japanese oru meaning to fold and gami meaning paper, is the art of folding paper. People have created some beautiful origami pieces just by folding a single piece of paper, and this geometric art form has a lot of math baked into it. If we take an origami piece and unfold it, we get this. These lines are the skeleton for how the origami piece is folded. The first thing we should talk about are the types of folds. There are two types of folds, mountain folds and valley folds. A mountain fold is a fold where the two flaps go below the crease, which makes a mountain shape. You can probably figure out that that means a valley fold is when the two flaps go above the crease, making a valley shape instead. It is very important to know which type of fold is on a crease, so the two folds are notated differently. Each person has their own notation, but for this video, I will go with a solid line for a mountain fold and a dotted line for a valley fold. Here's an example of how I would notate the folds. Say we take a piece of paper, fold it in half, and then fold it in half again. When we unfold it, notice how some folds are curving down, or mountain folds, and some folds are curving up, or valley folds. This piece of paper would be notated like this. Be especially careful with how multiple folds affect creases. This fold changes from a valley fold to a mountain fold after crossing the first crease. Whenever we have a notated piece of paper like this, it is called a crease pattern. There are three constraints for crease patterns. First, a crease pattern must only have folds that are necessary when folding the paper. For example, if I were to make a diagonal fold, then unfold it, then I did the same two folds as I did before, the diagonal fold will not be included in the crease pattern. Sometimes, creases are made to make other folds easier. These are called auxiliary folds. They are not included in the final crease pattern. The second is that all folds can be folded completely and the paper will lie flat. This is known as flat foldability. For example, if we take the wings of the origami crane and fold them down, all folds are folded completely and the crane lies flat. The third rule for making a crease pattern is that the paper must not cross through itself. Some people consider this one of the laws of origami, but I feel that the laws of origami are consequences of the constraints. The crease patterns could allow for a paper to cross through itself, but since the paper is a physical object, it should not. No rule is disallowing this, so I am putting it as a constraint. There is still some interesting math behind this, so I will leave a link in the description. With these three constraints, there are three consequences that result from this. The first of these three laws is to colorability. This law states that any crease pattern can be colored with only two colors, so any two areas separated by a fold are different colors. Let's look at a couple examples. Here is the crease pattern from earlier with two folds. It is very clear to see how to two color this crease pattern. And here is the crease pattern for an origami crane. This one's a lot harder, but once one region color is picked, the rest are decided. But how would we prove this? Let's say we were standing on the paper in its flat folded state, and we color the region we're on blue. If we go over any fold, we flip upside down, and we can color this region a different color, like green. Anytime we are right side up, we color the region blue, and when we are upside down, we color the region green. We can only be either right side up and blue, or upside down and green, and the only way to change this is to go across a fold. Therefore. Any two regions separated by a fold have different colors, and only two colors are required, satisfying two colorability. This has an especially important consequence. If we walk around a vertex in a circle, the amount of folds must be even. If it isn't, then the colors will alternate and the last region will be both blue and green. Or if we think about our flipping, this means that we will cross an odd amount of lines and be on the opposite side of the paper, which cannot happen. This will be useful for the next law. The next law is the alternating sum law. This law states that if we take alternating angles around a vertex, they will sum to 180 degrees. Let's look at a couple examples on the crane crease pattern. In the center, we have 90, skip, 45, skip, 45, and skip. This sums to 180. In this spot, we have angles of 77.5, and 102.5, which also sums to 180. 
Another way to phrase this law is to say if we alternate adding and subtracting angles around a vertex, the sum will always be 0 degrees. Looking back at the two examples, we have 90 minus 45 plus 45 minus 90 plus 45 minus 45 equals 0. And 77.5 minus 45 plus 102.5 minus 135 equals 0. To prove this law, let's get back to the idea of walking around a vertex in a circle. In the unfolded state, we go around the vertex in a 360 degree motion and stop in the same spot. However, if we walk around the same vertex, but when the paper is flat folded, we don't go around the vertex, but still end at the same spot. This means that in the flat folded version, the amount of walking right side up must exactly cancel out with the amount of walking upside down. And since we know that the only way to change between right side up and upside down is by crossing a fold line, the angles will alternate between upside down and right side up. The two must cancel out to get zero degrees, which matches the second statement. We have 360 degrees to work with, so that must be equally split between the blue angles and green angles. This matches the first statement, stating that the alternating angles sum to 180 degrees. The last of these laws is this, absolute value of m minus v equals 2. This one is super easy to prove. Take out the v-shape from the m to get 2i's, which is 2 in Roman numerals. Easy. Okay, but in all seriousness, the law states that the amount of mountains and valley folds at a point differ by exactly two. Either there are two more mountain folds or two more valley folds. This works for any point on a crease, even in the middle of one. Coming up with an easily presentable proof was difficult, but here is what I came up with. Say we stuck a pole through the paper at the point we want to check. We stand at a point and tie a rope connecting us to the pole. If we walk around in a circle, we will wrap around the pole once. If we take a top-down view of the pole, the pole will be the red dot, mountain folds will be a black dot, and valley folds will be a white dot. The blue and green line is the path, not creases. For example, a valley fold will look like this. Since we want flat foldability, it is very important to note that all lines are straight, and the only way to change direction is to go around a fold. Any fold is a 180 degree turnaround. If two different folds are next to each other, it makes a z-shape, which has the effect of the two folds cancelling out. You can imagine cutting the overlapping lines and taping them back at the end so it becomes one line. Whenever we have some path around the pole, and there are both mountain and valley folds, we can cancel all pairs until we get just one type of fold. Since we only go around the pole once, this type of fold must account for exactly a 360 degree rotation, which must be done by two 180 degree turnarounds. This means that there are exactly two more mountain or valley folds. As a result of the constraints, three laws can be derived. Two colorability, an alternating angle sum of zero, and a constant difference of two between mountain and valley folds. However, there is one massive edge case that I have been neglecting this whole time, the edge. The edge does not work the same as creases, and, as a challenge, what can we do on the paper to make sure that behavior around the edge works as well? Let me know what you find. Thank you for listening to me, counting to three, I hope you learned something new, and I hope to see you in another video.